Okay, everyone, good afternoon and welcome back. I just wanna, once again, I'm Shannon Sullivan. I'm a um, clinical professor in the Division of um, Pulmonary Asthma and Sleep Medicine here at Stanford. And I uh, just wanted to, again, thank all of the speakers that have presented so far. This has been an absolutely thought-provoking and amazing um, moment to come together. And I am so happy to now move on to our fourth of the scheduled sessions. This is towards solutions. So moving from a call to action to actual action. Um, and I am delighted to introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Vivian Lee. She is an executive fellow at Harvard Business School and a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School and the Mass Gen. She's also author of the book, The Long Fix, Solving America's Healthcare Crisis with Strategies That Work for Everyone. She's been named one of modern healthcare's most influential people in healthcare and is a frequent speaker on the applications of big data and technology in healthcare, leadership and managing change, health equity and climate change. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Shannon. And uh, thank you, David, also. Thank you for organizing such an amazing meeting. It's wonderful to be here. Now, I hope that some of you are, or most of you are familiar with Menti because we're gonna start with a few questions as soon as I go through my disclosures. So this gives you just enough time to get your camera and do the QR, or you can type into menti.com. And those of you who are online can do this too. Everyone can join in. Um, but as you're doing that, I'm going to go to my disclosures where I still have the QR. So, uh, and just say that I, um, after a long career in academic medicine, most recently I was uh, actually, I got to know Shannon uh, during my time at Verily, which is a healthcare and life sciences company of Alphabet. And then maybe the other disclosures that are relevant here is I am an adult MR radiologist, but most recently I joined the board of Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of children's health, of course, also being a mother. And also uh, we founded a foundation, a nonprofit called the Rocks Foundation. And I'm gonna show you at the very end, a little bit of work that we're doing, just starting to get into climate change and health. Okay, was that enough time? I hope that was enough time for everybody to, to move in. So I'm gonna now switch to my Menti slides. Why are you doing Anybody need more time? Just raise your hand if, if you want me to. You can't put in the code? Oh, you know what? So if the QR code doesn't work, I suggest going right to www.menti.com and, and use the code that way um, and see if that makes a difference. Is it not working? Thumbs up if it's working. Thumbs up if it's working, yeah. Are you already on the first question? Okay, well, let's try. Okay, let's try. Looks like we have 37 people. 37 people? Yeah, we're getting there. If you go through the website, yes. I feel like I need to give it a couple more minutes though. There's some percolating. Okay, let's try. Let's try. That's right. Is this working? Oh, yay. Look at that. <laughs> I'm a mentee novice. Okay, I've done it a lot of times. It's my first time trying it. So. Okay, so here, this is an open-ended question. What comes to mind when you hear the words climate change and health? And it should turn into a word cloud as soon as somebody starts entering words. Oh, here we go. You type it and then maybe you hit enter. I don't know, five people have figured it out. I'm not sure. Is that right? Do you enter the word in there? And then you can enter multiple words if you feel like it. I didn't constrain that. We've heard so many different dimensions of climate change and health today. So I'm, I'm actually um, really curious. I think of, of all groups, this is gonna be one of the most diverse um, word clouds probably out there. So we're seeing a lot of pollution, danger, declining, disasters. Um, multi-sectorial, of course, asthma and allergies. I would expect that in this group for sure. Um, okay, and then some things about food insecurity, vector-borne diseases. Um, 
Interestingly, what I'm not seeing is any too many, and, and I don't want to influence you, so you know, maybe we've collected most of the data now, um, but I'm not seeing a lot of optimism, opportunity, chances for us to bring the world together, united in a common, you know, common mission. Interesting. Okay. All right. How about the next question? Okay, here, now these are some sliding scales. So how strongly do you feel about these statements? You slide it to the right if you feel very strongly, to the left if you feel negatively about that, or you feel that it's not a true statement. So climate change is happening. Um, my patients are impacted by climate change. That's obviously more for clinicians, but if you're doing research studies, your research subjects, for example, um, I'm knowledgeable about climate change and its impacts on health. My organization is prioritizing helping patients adapt to climate change. My organization is prioritizing reducing its environmental impact itself. And my organization has an effective disaster readiness plan. And then lastly, I believe my organization should commit to meeting national net zero emission goals. Those are sort of the national goals that um, President Biden and others have articulated. Okay, we have a lot of responses here. Okay, so overall, vast majority of people, obviously there's a little bit of self-selection in this group, climate change is happening. Um, and this is really, these numbers are more reflecting, I think, the worldwide sentiment. Um, and a lot of people feel that their patients are impacted by climate change, pretty knowledgeable group overall, although I think there's still room uh, for many of us, certainly for myself. Interesting, a little bit lower on the organization, how we feel our organizations are doing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about organizations today. So I think that's really um, very, very relevant. Um, and then a high level of belief that we should, that, that our organization should commit to these national net zero goals. Okay, terrific, thank you. All right, how about next one? If you are a clinician, um, do you discuss climate change with your patients and their families? And maybe if you're a patient, has your clinician discussed with you climate change as a patient or as a parent? And if neither of those apply to you, sorry. Okay, so we're seeing not a lot of, not as many votes. So I'm sorry, would, this question may not feel as relevant to everybody, but um, if you're a patient, if you have a pediatrician, does your pediatrician, has your pediatrician ever discussed climate change with you, for example? Um, so we're, we're seeing a few, I'm curious about the regularlies. So maybe when we get to the Q&A and discussion, I'll be curious to hear from the regularlies and the offens. Uh, did you learn a little bit more about that? Okay, how do we feel? Most people feel like they voted who want to vote. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we might have one more. Oh, if not, why not? Just a moment to type in. If, if this question is applicable to you and you maybe if you're a clinician really, why don't you? What is keeping you from talking about it? Not enough time not applicable. Just give a couple more seconds. Time constraints, patients don't wanna talk about it. Patients unwillingness, that's interesting. No easy solution, big topic beyond the scope, cynicism. Okay, let's see. Maybe not enough time, hasn't come up, maybe politics. And there's some other issues and too much, too little time. Yeah, perennial problem of too little time. Okay, thank you. Good, good responses there. And then let's see if we go to the last question. Okay, I would be or I am optimistic that the future of planetary health is bright if something happened or I am optimistic because fill in the blank. So I didn't want to assume that you weren't optimistic, although from the word cloud, I think I probably can assume that, but, <laughs> but I would be optimistic that the future planetary health would, is bright if, 
if what? I felt the need to put in this question because I was put under the solution section. So, so I thought I could use a little help. If I saw unity and coordinated action, oh, if the U has for me is a superpower, interesting. If we all became aware, so a lot of collective action issues here, if everyone did his or her part, if more people took it seriously, I am optimistic because we can motivate change together. If people weren't so divided, we are creative and collaborative, change is possible. Increase in awareness or increasing, uh, sorry, interest in awareness. If people voted rationally, more, <laughs> more education, parties were on the same page. If more money was prioritized, these are great answers actually. I really appreciate this, the thoughtfulness of these. Okay, I feel like good, good range of viewpoints here. So do we have enough resources? First of all, is there a collective action issue and the politics? And there is a fair amount, some optimism about if we can get everyone together and actually work together that we're optimistic. And then do we have enough resources and do we have enough kind of willpower really to address this? I feel like that's what we're hearing. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Now, um, I am going to now go back to my presentation. If you still want to type in, I think the thing still stays open for as long as you'd like to enter. So, so I'm going to move back to my uh, presentation now and say that um, throughout uh, most of the history of mankind, our community, our societies have turned to us in healthcare really to uh, to help save lives in times of crisis, whether they were in, you know, during in war times or even, of course, most recently during the pandemic. And my own experience of this actually came about when I um, first moved our family out to Salt Lake City, where I was the dean of the medical school and CEO of the health system there. And for those of you who haven't been in Salt Lake, this is a map, an aerial map of Salt Lake City, and you can see the Wasatch Mountains, which is uh, part of the Rockies, coming right up to the edge of the city. And you see the University of Utah right at the base of the mountains. And it happens to be, not surprisingly, maybe because of the size of the mountains, that this is a, a major uh, fault zone, an earthquake fault zone. And if you kind of zoom up, you notice how that fault zone line words sort of layer right over the University of Utah. Well, if you look at the campus that I found myself responsible for, the University of Utah Hospitals, Primary Children's Hospital, which is a collaborative effort between Intermountain and the University of Utah. And then if you take from the Utah Geologic Survey and just overlay the fault line on top of our campus, you can see that our hospital was built right on top of the fault line. So as soon as I arrived, I was introduced to a completely different culture that thought every day about a potential disaster, a potential crisis, because we were right on this fault line. And the probabilities were pretty high. They were not trivial in terms of the risk of a significant earthquake um, in the next 50 years. And so we engaged actively in disaster preparedness. Uh, we had scenario planning all the time. We got the walkie-talkies. We put on the, the orange jackets and did all those uh, scenarios. And I have to say that this is something now that I feel all health systems should routinely engage in, because while not all health systems are physically located on a fault line, thank goodness, most of us, as we've seen through um, many of the presentations today, have some significant ris uh, risk of being exposed to at least one, if not multiple kinds of disasters. And there's extensive information uh, and materials available for hospital preparedness. And so I, we, we did the survey about how many of you think your hospitals or your health systems um, are prepared, and it's not a majority. And I'm curious how many of you have actually participated in any kind of disaster preparedness scenario planning? Okay, that's good. Uh, maybe about 20% in the room. So. That number really needs for effective disaster preparedness needs to be 100%, right? We all need to go through that kind of planning. And um, so I, uh, one of the things that really struck me when I got to Utah was the fact that we had done all this preparedness. And then about six or eight months later, the place that I had worked in for the last 15 years, NYU, 
was affected as, along with most of the East Coast by Hurricane Sandy. And as you'll remember, Hurricane Sandy was the storm that actually flooded out the generators at NYU and of course caused a massive amount of damage all along the Northeast. Um, but I'm particularly familiar with NYU because they lost the power. So we had the early discussion about a heat plus power loss. So this was exactly an example of that. It wasn't heat, but we had a massive power loss and people were carrying patients down uh, flights of stairs at Bellevue and at NYU. And it caused an enormous amount of damage. Um, the wildfires I don't need to talk about in terms of uh, the exposures, because we've talked a lot about that here, but really even just the physical risk of the facilities being exposed to the fire and the effect of the fires on our staff, on our employees, um, but in addition to our patients and our ability to deliver care and support our communities during these periods of time. Um, then of course, there's on top of that, the heat waves, um, as well as the massive flooding um, conditions. And just to point out that last summer, uh, the Pakistan floods alone destroyed almost 1,500 healthcare facilities. So one thing I think that we need to keep in mind when we take a more uh, system level view of climate change is the really vital need for our health system. So all of you work in some kind of a health system um, for our, vice, our health systems to be resilient enough to be able to support our communities. Um, and I don't think we do enough about that, but I think there, that it, it's a very well-established field and we could just be doing more there. Um, we've talked a lot about the threat to global public health and the fact that health is the human face of climate change. And so I won't dwell on these slides about air quality, but I do, I did want to play this video because here we are in California. And again, we lived uh, several years in Utah. And this video just shows you the, some of the fires from Northern California and Oregon and how the smoke came over and made our whole sky. N notice how in this particular fire from 2021, it really didn't affect California as much as it did out West. And those were the days, you know, we had those crazy orange skies as they were having and had, had recently in New York, for example. Um, I did want to just call out th these couple of papers, even though I know that this literature is probably more familiar to you than it, but it was new to me and it was very worrisome to me. So we talked about pregnancy um, and the risk. And this was a paper that came out um, last year that aggregated multiple uh, studies and just was very striking to me, the specific um, correlation between increased PM 2.5 at ages two to four and the association with both behavioral problems as well as um, lower IQ scores, especially for uh, females. I feel embarrassed showing this in front of like the world's experts. So, you know, uh, this other study, this is probably the last uh, study in this space that I'm gonna show, but this second study was one, another one from China, the China Family Panel Studies. And here looking at, you know, these are the longitudinal studies where every year the subjects undergo both verbal and math uh, tests. And it, the, this study showed a relationship between poor air quality and decreased performance, especially on the verbal test scores, not so much on the math test scores, and especially for men, especially less well-educated men of higher age. And then the mental health issues um, have also been alluded to today. And in particular, I imagine that most people are familiar with this paper from Lancet Planetary Health. And if you aren't, I definitely suggest that you take a look at this paper. They surveyed 10,000 young people between the ages of 16 and 25 and across all these 10 different countries. So a thousand in each country and really asked them about their feelings about climate change. So it was really a measure of climate anxiety how worried were they? So if you look at the dark red and the orange, those are extremely worried and very worried. So you can see that really, especially in those countries that are most likely to be pretty severely affected, like in the Philippines and Brazil um, and India, very high levels of climate anxiety, a lot of impact on function, and then a lot of questions about their belief in whether government is supporting them or taking of effective action. Of course, most of them feel that that's not happening. Um, and then of course, we've talked about the fact that it's really hitting the, the poorest, the hardest. 
So from a health system perspective, which is uh, where I was viewing really this part, I think there are a number of things that we have to do to help support our communities beyond the health care that we have to provide. And one of them is really strengthening our own infrastructure. So one of the things, for example, that we looked at very carefully when I first arrived at Utah was our resilience in the face of natural disasters that would disrupt our energy supply. So for the very reasons that we talked about, we actually built a cogen facility on our own plant, uh, on our own physical footprint. Um, now you can put in solar and do microgrids. Anyway, there are many opportunities to create an energy independence on your own physical facility, which I think are vital for the reasons that we already heard about earlier today, in addition to thinking about communications and transportation resilience. We have a lot of supply chain issues. I mean, the, the issues when um, Hurricane Maria and we had disruption, for example, from Puerto Rico and our saline bag shortage even, um, these are issues that we've seen again with COVID and we really just need to create more redundancy in our supply chain. Um, besides supply, supporting our employees and their families. And then uh, very importantly, we saw in the pandemic um, a lack of financial resilience among our health systems. So because of our fee-for-service model of care, when we don't have patients coming through the door regularly, when we're in, our operating rooms are regularly filled in that way, then we, because of the model of paying for health care in this country, outside of the VA, outside of military health, aside of from a few exceptions, um, we really have very little tolerance for any disruption in our services from a financial perspective. And that's actually a real weakness in this country. So we've talked a lot about, I think, the adaptation side and the need for preparing for climate events and understanding a lot today about uh, the various consequences of climate. We've touched on so many different, I've learned so much today. What I'd like to talk a little bit more about is the other responsibility that I think health systems have, which is how to mitigate, how to reduce the environmental impact of the care that we provide. And that can be through a number of ways, whether it's reducing greenhouse gases or reducing the waste or actually improving education and communication with our patients and our communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. So let's talk a little bit about healthcare's carbon footprint. So many of you may be aware that uh, the U.S. here is number one in the world in terms of our carbon footprint. It's estimated that around um, that the healthcare footprint is around eight and a half percent of our total carbon footprint in this country. Um, taken together, we account for about a quarter of the world's global healthcare footprint. And there's this whole issue of health affairs dedicated to this topic, which uh, was absolutely superb. Um, if healthcare were ranked as a nation in this country, we would be 13th. We actually, are, just our healthcare system in the U.S., produces more emissions than the entire country uh, of the United Kingdom. And so what, what are those emissions made of? Uh, well, we typically talk about them in scope one, two, and three. Scope one are direct emissions, so that's fossil fuels, that's kind of our energy production, and then anesthetic gases. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, scope two is our purchased energy, that's about 11%, but the vast majority of our emissions are really related to the choices that we make when we practice medicine or when we do research. Um, so the pharmaceuticals, the medical devices, the supplies, the various, um, the various um, equipment that we use for our research as well, food, transportation, and other purchase services. So I have a brief digression, and for those of you who are experts in this field, just bear with me. It's not very long, but for those of you who are a little bit relatively new, um, I myself found this helpful, so I hope this is helpful to you. So just a quick glossary of key terms. When we talk about greenhouse gases, we're mostly talking about carbon dioxide, but there are other gases that are very important for us to consider. Um, it's measured, we're measuring carbon dioxide in usually billions of metric tons. And I didn't really have a feeling for a ton of carbon dioxide because I'm thinking this is a gas, you know, what's a ton of a gas? So just in case you were curious about that, a ton of carbon dioxide is basically a square, a cube, not a square, but a cube with one length about 27 feet, which is about the height of a telephone pole. So just in case you're curious about that. and. 
the other thing that we talk about when we think about greenhouse gases is carbon dioxide equivalents, and this is where the anesthetic gases become so important. So most health systems, one of the first things they do when they think about lowering their carbon footprint, they focus on anesthetic gases because we use a lot of desfluorane, or we did, many people are switching off now, but generally we, we made a big switch to desfluorane about 10 years ago. And one ton of desfluorane has the warming capacity or warming potential of 2,500 uh, tons of carbon dioxide. So that's why we have so much focus on that. And switching desfluorine to sevofluorine, obviously sevofluorine still isn't perfect, but it's significantly lower. So just to kind of give you a feeling for that. Um, here's what we look like globally. So globally, carbon dioxide emissions alone, 36 billion tons. And interestingly, US, if you look at the US graph, we've actually gone down. So we are kind of heading in the right direction, room for optimism, right? The, the problem is, of course, the developing countries, they want to live at our standards and have nice, cool, or very cold rooms like this um, are, are really just, you know, blowing it out of the water, China, India, especially. Um, and of course, there's this whole argument about uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and other un, un, underdeveloped countries and their right to become a developed country. So, um, and that would lead to increased carbon dioxide production. Still, even though we're going down, our per capita consumption in the US is still about four times higher than uh, the average in the world. Um, I did talk a little bit about scope one, two, and three, and I just wanna mention this because I'll say that one of the first steps in trying to decarbonize anything is to have accurate measurements and this is an area that's very, very challenging. It's very difficult to measure, um, particularly scope three, because scope three are measured, uh, they're sort of downstream and upstream. So what your consumers or your customers or your patients do with all their products and how they dispose of them count to your carbon footprint. So it's, it's actually a very problematic measurement system. Um, and so there's actually been a lot of work done in improving uh, the measurement system, which I'm happy to talk about more if people have questions. Um, and then this is the last, I think, slide on this 101 section, which is just, what are we trying to do? We're trying to reduce our emissions overall. Our aim, was to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Most people feel that that's not, a, uh, we're already almost there, if not already there. Uh, around the corner, we're about at one degree, I think pretty consistently now. Uh, so the overall goal though here is still to try to reach net zero by 2050 and to reduce our emissions in half by 2030. And President Biden did issue this um, call to action to health sector leaders, about a hundred systems have signed on to it. It's non-binding. Um, but that's when I was asking you, like, do you believe your system should do that? Uh, that's really where that's coming from, because really it's a call for the entire country, the entire world, really to do this. So I think this is a moment where there's clearly a lot of need for collective action. We saw that in the word cloud. I think we all feel that, you know, it's time maybe not just to stand there and maybe start doing something. So here's where I, as an adult MR radiologist turn administrator, techie, I'm going to try to make some recommendations for pediatric pulmonologists. So, you know, just, uh, you know, you get what you're, okay. So let me just start here by uh, reviewing for you what you may or may not know, which is that the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2015 actually made these recommendations to all pediatricians. I'm curious how many of you who are practicing pediatrically trained people, oh, was this your work? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So here we go. Here we go. So I've highlighted in bold. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah seriously. Okay. So now the, the, the question is how can we act on this? So 2015 too, that's a long time ago. So the, I highlight in bold, especially use existing anticipatory guidance as a framework for discussing climate change. First organization. First organization. 2007 was the first, right? So Excellent. Okay, so way to go, pediatrics, and it, and others have followed. So you know the AMA has a bunch of things now out. A bunch of different associations, anesthesiologists have sort of caught on because of their issues. But great job, pediatricians. So now I'm curious about how many of you are familiar with this work. So this is a, a guy. Uh, he's a pediatrician, Andrew Lewandowski, who. Um, Practices private practice in Wisconsin in Madison, and um, and he did a very interesting study where he decided to start putting in practice those recommendations, and so he decided um, actually during the pandemic 
to um, raise the question or raise this issue, talk about climate change with his patients during their well child visits. So not, you know, not if there was some disaster going on, but during a well child visit. And here's the script that he put together based on, he just made this up, I think, based on the guidelines. So in the last two years, the American Academy of Pediatrics and a hundred other organizations declared climate change a health emergency. Air pollution alone caused over 64,000 premature deaths in the US. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So just like I want your children to eat healthy foods and be in the right car seat for their health and safety, we now know that decreasing our energy use, increasing energy efficiency and supporting clean energy initiatives are also important for improving our children's health. Any questions? And when he does it, it's 45 seconds. Uh, and so he did it for a couple hundred patients and here are his, and then he did a survey afterwards. And he first asked them what was their prior awareness of health harms. Um, and, and he actually looked at their political uh, backgrounds. And then he asked them whether they felt like they learned something. So uh, around 80 or 90, around 90% thought they did. And then he asked them their likelihood of changing energy use behaviors. And I just concentrate on the likely and very likely being in the high 80s to 90% and also their likelihood of supporting clean energy initiatives. Um, so for those of you who don't do it or who worry about it, he does reassure folks if you talk to him that it did not turn away any of his patients. He did not lose any patients through doing this. So for those of you who are worried about your patients not being receptive to it. Um, so I hope that we will see these guidelines carried out more. Uh, a second point that I want to make here, and I realize I'm actually going too long, so I'm going to go a little faster, sorry, um, is the ability to provide our patients with more information and more education about the environment. And I have to mention, having been in tech the last few years, the opportunities around digital health to provide that um, extra information. Um, and then to say one quick word about uh, in the world of pulmon pulmonology, the inhalers are the equivalents of the sevoflurane and desflurane for anesthesiologists. The pressurized meter dose inhalers are uh, do have a higher carbon footprint, significantly higher. The propellants in there are significantly higher, um, 13 to 33,000 times the carbon dioxide equivalent. And so there's a lot in the literature, you're probably already aware of this to try to move towards alternatives. So I have a couple more slides about the roles of hospitals here. And just to say that I hope that many of you who work in health systems, whether it's here or elsewhere, will move this through your whole system, will sort of propagate your passion for this field throughout the entire health system. And I think there's a lot of work we still have to do to educate people in healthcare, especially healthcare leadership, about the need to decarbonize healthcare. So there's some primers. The HHS is saying we're going to try to start setting the expectation that there's going to be a need for reporting on greenhouse gas emissions. So warning to all you systems. Uh, JACO has already said that they already want a carbon plan for most health systems as part of accreditation. So there is already some motion there. And I won't go through these case studies, but I will say for those of you who are teetering on being optimistic, that a number of these systems have done a lot of really terrific things to lower their carbon footprint and lower their health expenses or their facility expenses or whatever. It's really driven a lot of savings. So whether it's Boston Medical Center, Kaiser Permanente, um, or the entire National Health Service in the UK, which is committed to, to decarbonizing their entire system. And if you want to be really optimistic, you should go onto their website because they have case study after case study after case study. Um, and every one of their 219 trusts now has a net zero carbon plan that they've posted online. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in August also gives us significant financial incentives as health systems and nonprofits to convert to renewable energies, enormous incentives, um, actual direct payments back to us, 30, 40, 50, or 60% of our actual capital cost for making those transitions. And now renewable energy actually costs less than fossil fuel energy. So once you make the capital investment, it's actually less. And then there are a number of uh, RFPs. Somebody was asking about what the NIH is doing. So I'm gonna finish with this um, observation, which is that I've been thinking a lot about reforming healthcare uh, for, for most of my career. And many of the things that we talk about, like more prevention in primary care, reducing unnecessary care, 
reducing waste, you know, trying to basically reduce our expenses, stronger communities, all of these things I think are very much aligned with what we need to do to tackle climate change. And one of the things that I think is really um, unfortunate right now is this, is this narrative of tackling climate change is somehow at odds with or distraction from what we need to do in terms of reforming healthcare. And I'd like that narrative to change. And instead, I'd like us to think about these as totally aligned. That, uh, And if you think about how your workforce, your communities, would they rather hear this which is what a lot of hospital CEOs are saying or health system leaders, got to improve our margin, got to decrease our expenses, you know, or would you rather hear, hey, we need to reduce the waste that pollutes our oceans and our air and our ecosystem. We need to build in capacity to care for ourselves and we need to make the future brighter and save our planet. The two are really have a lot of overlapping actions and I think it's a much more engaging narrative. Um, so let me finish with this very quick. Uh, which is for those of you who are interested in taking this back, whether it's to your groups or whether to your divisions or to hospital leadership or to boards, um, this nonprofit that I'm a part of, a Rocks Foundation, has put together a little do-it-yourself toolkit for running a workshop or running a retreat. It's totally free. This is a nonprofit. And this is what the website looks like. And it's really just got basically agendas with lots of resources. We've just curated all this kind of content from the web. So five minute podcasts we like, or you know, very quick uh, reads. And then all the way to the actual workshop agendas for people who wanna to put together like an hour, put together a couple hour retreat. So just to encourage you or welcome people who are interested in, um, in offering those kinds of uh, sessions to your teams, because uh, I do think we need to educate people a lot more about that. Okay, so thank you very much. Sorry to go over, but thank you. Wow.